Thank you, choir. <clears throat> God is indeed uh, just an awesome God. As the choir has been practicing for our cantata next week, uh, as I had been working with Sherry and kind of laying out this Advent series of, of life talks that I would bring to you, each song within the cantata lined up with the sermons that I had already decided that what I was going to preach. And we just constantly marvel how God and the Holy Spirit just work all things together. So that is one of the songs from the musical that you'll be blessed with next week. Well, church, um, you might know me well enough to know that this might not be a surprise, but the Advent series that you probably have come to expect year after year is not the Advent series that you're going to hear. I tend to bring the unexpected out of Scripture. I'm coming to see that that perhaps is one of the gifts that God has given me, that I can look at Scripture, and it might be the simplicity of my mind, but I ask questions about the Scripture, and I come up with uh, a different understanding than I had been taught or that I have come to know. And so as we embrace Advent, it's this time of waiting. That's what Advent means, and we're waiting to be able to celebrate uh, the Christ child. We have gifts in front of us, and they are the gifts of hope and peace and joy and love. We light a candle each week, and today we lit the candle of hope. And so we can really make that very pretty as this, this sanctuary has been adorned with decoration and the church. I'm just so thankful for the team that worked really hard to make our sanctuary and our church just a lovely greeting. But can I tell you that in reality, if we were to decorate for the real Christmas, here's what this sanctuary would look like. It would be a hot mess. There would be trash thrown on the floor. We would not dust. The hallways would have perhaps used diapers littering the hallways. That is probably more in line with an understanding of the original Christmas than what we celebrate today. And so I just need to warn you, these life talks might be a little unexpected, but I hope that it is like a diamond, that as you peer and you look at the diamond, you will see more deeply the very gifts of hope and peace, and joy, and love. You know, when you first see a diamond on someone's finger or your own diamond, you look at it, and it just glistens, doesn't it? It's just, it's brilliant, and it draws the notice. You know, everyone is like, oh, that's just beautiful. Well, after you've been married a few years, and you make pies, and you bang it against a chalkboard, and, you know, you live into your life with your diamond on your finger, it begins to change, doesn't it? It loses some of its brilliance and its luster. Literally, it does. It, it begins to get dull, and some of the prongs start to, to become smooth. And, and that diamond has to be taken back to the jeweler, doesn't it? So that the prongs can be rebuilt, and, and the jeweler restores that diamond to its original brilliance and luster. Well, can I ask you to accept that analogy, that that's what we have done to the Christmas story? We have retold the Christmas story. We have added, we have subtracted throughout history. That story has been retold until it has lost some of its brilliance. I mean, as we open up the Scripture this morning, some of you might say, I know this story. I mean, I, I hear this story every year. It's usually the same story on the same week of Advent, and I could probably, if you shut down the screen, I could continue to tell you the story. But my prayer is that we look at this scripture and that through the power of the Holy Spirit, you are able to see something that you might have been missing. So that as you greet the Christ child on Christmas Eve, that you will greet Jesus in a way that perhaps is deeper and far more brilliant than you have ever encountered Christ before. So I'm going to tell you, you don't want to miss a Sunday, and you want to bring a friend, because I probably will not be saying Merry Christmas for the next four weeks. I will be returning Christmas to its original brilliance, and I will probably tell you, messy Christmas. Messy Christmas. For that is the real story. And that is the reality in which Jesus comes. 
So let us open up the Word of God. If you want to grab your Bibles in front of you or your iPhones, um, I'm so appreciative that this service is being taped, so I want to welcome our friends that are listening online. So we're going to the Gospel of Luke, and we're starting in verse 26. Now we begin with perhaps a question, because Luke begins this section of Scripture, and he says, in the sixth month. Now, if you're a critical reader of Scripture, you should stop right there. When you read the Bible and you read something you don't understand, stop. Don't keep going. In the sixth month, the sixth month of what? Whose sixth month? And so we have to go back and consider the context in which this story is set in. There are 400 years of darkness that the people lived in. They had not heard from God. And in, in before this Scripture, what we find is God speaks into an old priest's life. And his name is Zechariah. Now, Zechariah is on the list to serve the temple, and so his name comes up. It's kind of like a lottery. And he goes to the temple, and Zechariah begins to serve in the temple courts. And, and Zechariah is a priest. As he's worshiping on behalf of the people, he goes into the Holy of Holies. In our modern-day definition, you are praying so deeply, you lose yourself. And I hope some of you know what that means. You just start out by praying, and then you're, you just sit in the presence of God, and you give it enough time and enough practice, and pretty soon you just stop praying, and you realize, I'm in the presence of God, and you just bask in it. And I can imagine that Zechariah probably was in that very state, in the Holy of Holies, and he sensed the presence of God. And he says, God, I am here with the prayers of the people, but I've got something on my mind God, Yahweh, I have asked for this. I've asked for this every day of my life since I've been married. Elizabeth and I, you know, because you've heard it every single day. We've asked you for a child. Now, I can imagine that Zachariah probably brings that prayer every single day. Have you brought a prayer every day to God? Is there something that's just on your heart and you just think, I'm just going to pray for it, and every day you, you, just, you just bring that? And, and, and if you're being real, there's going to be times when you bring it and it's like, well, God, here I am again. Haven't gotten it yet. So I'm just going to say it because my hope and my faith and my belief, it's pretty dim today, but I'll present it to you. I don't know where Zachariah's heart was on this particular day, but he was in the Holy of Holies. So maybe this was a time that he sensed the presence of his Yahweh and he said, God, I can't help, but in this time... You know, it's kind of laughable because we're way beyond childbearing years. But do you know that prayer that I've prayed every day? Well, I just want to throw that in too. I just want to tell you that we've longed for a child. And it hasn't happened and it probably won't, but, but here I am. And God speaks to Zechariah. And God says, Zechariah, I've heard. And the proper time has come. And you will have a son you have a son, and you'll name him John. And Zechariah, in every call narrative, just like every other person is called by God in the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, Zechariah goes, huh? Are you serious? Like I said the prayer, but, you know, you're a little late. Did I tell you how old Elizabeth is right now? And then Zechariah gets a sense that God is a God of the impossible. And so in every, in every call story, the very first step of a call story, and this ought to make you feel a whole lot easier about yourself, is resistance. God calls and humankind resists. It's okay. God understands our humanity. When God calls us to something that's bigger than ourselves, we're going to go, did I hear it right? Oh, that must just be me. Is it possible? Lord, you have the right person. There's resistance, and then God calls again, and God filled in the blanks for Zechariah, and God said, Zechariah, I'm going to give you a gift. This is a gift. Now, you might read your account in Luke, and you might say, no, 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 that was punishment, but I dare you to go back to the original meaning and understand that when Zechariah could not speak, it was a gift. Now, I'm not talking about the gift that I gave my husband when I came out of surgery and they nicked my vocal cord and I couldn't speak for four months. That might have been a gift. <laughs> but God literally gave Zachariah this 
gift of silence. It's a gift of silence. And God said, Zachariah, I love you so much that you're not going to speak until this baby is born. Because I'm giving you the gift of time and silence and being able to mull it over and to see my power and my might work within your life. It's a gift, Zachariah. Friends, God might be giving you a gift and you see it as a punishment. I would ask that you just submit that to God. And say, God, in whatever it is, whatever burden, whatever mess I find myself, could you allow me to understand the giftedness in this? And so Zachariah doesn't speak. And Elizabeth sequesters herself for five months. Now let's get real with the scripture. Why would she do that? Can you imagine the talk? Can you imagine as she's going through town and she's buying her bread and her provisions, that people look at her and say, Elizabeth? You're gaining some weight. Surely it can't be anything else, but you're putting on weight, girl. And Elizabeth does almost the same thing as Zachariah. Zachariah has silence within, and Elizabeth creates a silence around her for five months. She just stays, and they stay private and quiet and perhaps prayerful with all the doubts and all the wonderments. And then Elizabeth feels this nudge in her tummy. And now... Now we're ready for the reality of our scripture. Now we understand after five months, after five months of perhaps darkness and doubt and, and wondering and prayer and hope and feeling life, this sixth month, you can't hide that you're pregnant. You start to pop. And it's in the sixth month that now God orchestrates something else to go on in God's good creation apart from Zachariah and Elizabeth. Perhaps nobody knew what was going on except something happened in the Holy of Holies and the priest Zachariah cannot speak. And so now we turn the diamond and we turn the lens and we begin in the sixth month. The angel Gabriel, top dog angel, the messenger, which is what Gabriel means, the messenger of God himself, was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and you will bear a son and you'll name him Jesus he will be great, and he'll be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there is not going to be an end. And Mary resisted, resisted, and said to the angel, how can this be? For I am a virgin. And the angel confirmed the call and said to her, The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. And by the way, now your relative Elizabeth in her old age also has conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren for nothing, nothing will be impossible with God. Then, which means after some time, not right away, 
Then, Mary said, here am I. I'm the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then, then the angel departed from her. This, this is the word of God in its original brilliance for you, the people of God, to receive. Thanks be to God. Have you ever had something unexpected happen in your life? Something you didn't see coming? Something that just dropped the bottom out of your life? And you wondered, how do I pick up the pieces? How do I move on? A relationship that's just shattered because one day your spouse comes home and says, I don't love you anymore. I found someone else. One day you get a letter from your doctor that said, the reports that we've been sending you about your blood work that say everything is normal, well, they went to the wrong person. Your reports reveal that nothing is normal and that you're terminal. That's the kind of reality, that's the kind of stuff the context that we have to put ourselves to understand the characters that come to us in the Christmas story. It's almost as if I would say to you, there was an accident on 81, and immediately you go and you focus on the accident, correct? Let me rephrase it and let me say there was an accident in our neighborhood. Now what are you thinking about? a little closer to home. Now you're visualizing your neighborhood, and now you're, it's starting to tug at your heartstrings because you're saying, well, who is it in my neighborhood? Is it someone that I might know? Let me rephrase it one more time. From the very beginning, there was an accident on the highway to there was an accident in your neighborhood to say, your neighbor, Joe, had an accident. Now, now your heart is literally involved, isn't it? Because Joe is one of your dear and closest friends and your neighbor that you've lived beside for a matter of years. Now all of a sudden you're drawn into the emotional drama of this story. It's not just any accident. It's my friend. And now my heart is reaching out. And that's where we need to be to embrace the Christmas story. And so many times we look at Mary, our first character. And we see Mary differently. We see her that she has encountered an angel and and she's able to somehow sustain this. She's perplexed, but then she says, well, then let it be as you say, because I'm the handmaiden of of the Lord. And, And she sings this beautiful song that we call the Magnificat. And we say, it must be something about Mary. We, we somehow have to elevate her that she was more special than we are. But in actuality, you and I are the Marys and the Josephs. Jesus comes to us in the mess that our lives are in. He comes to us in the clutter, in the hallways, and the byways of our life. This is where Jesus comes, and we can't can't pretty that up. What Jesus is saying to Mary is, Mary, here I am. And so when the angel comes to Mary, we we kind of wonder, like, isn't this a little upside down? Like, who is Mary? Well, let me tell you, Mary is no one, but Mary is someone. And you and I, we probably feel like we're no ones. We're nothing special. But what Jesus is saying in this narrative of birth is he says, no, I want to tell you, get into the, the depth of this story. You are someone Because Mary was just part of a little town called Nazareth. Now, Nazareth was was a small town. It was sitting next to a wealthy city called Sephoris. But Mary and her people were very plain people, very simple means. Mary may have worked in the wealthy town as a servant. 
And I can imagine as, as this caravan came and they started to form this town, this, this place together, they had to come up with a name. And they probably said, well, what should we name this place? And someone remembered the readings of Isaiah. And they said, you know what? We, we just, wow, we can just make it. You know, it's day-to-day -day existence. So maybe what we need to do is we need to breathe hope into our town, into our people. And so let's name this town Nazareth because Nazareth means hope. It comes from the Greek word N-E-T-Z-E-R, meaning the branch that we read in Isaiah, the branch of hope that's extended to God's people. And so they say, let's, let's name our town Hope. I mean, isn't that a great name? You know, they're probably thinking, and someday, maybe someday we'll get ahead and, and we won't just go from day to day and maybe someday we won't be so oppressed and, and maybe someday things will be better because every time we say the name of our town, we'll think of let's not lose hope. We need that in our lives. We need those words. We need that confirmation and the affirmation of God so that we don't lose hope when the bottom drops out. Do you know that in the history of humankind and of God interacting with humankind, do you know who God chose? He chose the no ones. God didn't choose some ones. He chose the no ones. He chose the insignificant. Jesse. Do you know that God chose the youngest of Jesse's sons, the youngest, to be the very king of Israel? God chose the slave people to be God's chosen people. God chose a simple handmaiden, a simple servant, to bear the very son of God. Paul tells the early Christians in the church of Corinth, he says this, Do you know, friends, God chooses what is foolish in this world to shame the strong in us. That's the upside-down kingdom principle. God chooses the no ones, and then he's able to say, you, by my grace, my power, my might, you're someone. You're someone. James says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Friends, you're not a child of God because you're good. I'm not a child of God because I'm good. You're a child of God because God is good. You're a no one. But what God is reaching down and saying to you and to me is, you are no one, but I, I make you a someone. I love you. Max Lucado says, it's like this. Jesus became like us so we could become like him. Angels still sing and the star still beckons, but he loves each of us like there's only one of us to love. Can you feel that kind of love this morning? So, let's talk about what the angel says. The angel appears to Mary and says, Mary, I've got some good news. Are you serious? Here's the good news that the angel says, uh, Mary, God has found favor with you. And by the way, you're going to conceive a son. And I know you're a virgin and all that that goes with it. And Mary has to take all of this in. How is it that Mary finds hope in the reality of her journey? Well, she doesn't. Not in and of herself. But remember, in the narrative that we read, the angel first says this to her. The angel doesn't say, Mary, you're going to bear a son. The angel says, Mary, God has found favor with you. God has found favor. Do you know what favor means? If you go back to the original brilliance, it is somewhat, Hail Mary, full of grace. You are full of grace. Now, that's a, a present participle that means not that Mary had grace, but God is giving her the gift of grace so that Mary will live in to grace. That's a whole lot different, isn't it? Bonnie and Dennis shared with us this morning about their granddaughter. But as I have gotten to know and love these two, two days before, if you would have asked Bonnie and Dennis, will you have the grace to get through having a granddaughter who has leukemia, and who may or may not make it. Do you have that grace? And they 
would tell you no. Two weeks before my daughter was diagnosed with the same disease, we sat on a sofa and watched the St. Jude's telethon, and we reached out and held each other's hands and tears coming down our, our, our eyes. And I said, I don't know that I could be a mama. I don't have the strength to do that. And she reached across and she said, I just know I'd find some other way, but I would not go through that kind of chemotherapy. It's just not for me. And two weeks to the day, we were doing it. Not because we had grace, but the real Christmas miracle is that you are given grace Amen. when you need it. Amen. When you need it. Not an ounce before, but exactly when you need it. We are told my grace is sufficient for you. That means there's nothing in your future that when you don't embrace the gift of hope that the angel gave Mary and that is speaking into our lives, that we can say, I do not fear the future, for I will have the grace of God to sustain me. That's a whole lot different. It doesn't make Mary all pretty. It makes Mary struggle and doubt and wonder and worry. This is a girl, friends, who has a lot to lose. She is going to be pregnant. She's going to lose her husband. I mean, in her mind, can you just imagine the scenarios? I'm engaged. I've been engaged for, uh, for at least a year now. I'm going to be married next year. This marriage has been arranged by our families for most of our lives. And perhaps even the bride price has been paid. I mean, it's a done deal. All but the final contract on my wedding day. And this means all of that is gone, dashed, and then what's worse is I'm left on my own with, an, with I'm unwed and I'm going to have a baby. And, and what, does, what does the law allow? Well, the law allows me to be stoned. And not just stoned in the far corner of the city, but I'm going to be marched right up to my parents' doorstep. So it's not just that I'm going to be stoned, but my whole family, my extended family, they're going to be shamed because the law declares that I need to be stoned in front of my father's door. So now all that's happening to me is going to filter out and everyone else is going to be affected as well. And I lose Joseph. I lose the security of a life. I lose my home. See, that's the reality. And that is impossible for any of us to get through on our own. That's messy Christmas. And into that mess, into that mess, comes grace. The angel says, Mary, you are being filled with grace. So I was finishing this sermon yesterday and just changing things around and praying over it as I typically do. And God always speaks. God always speaks reality into my life. And yesterday I received a phone call from my dear, dear friend, who when I moved here, she moved to Kentucky. And she said, Jan, I have to tell you something. She said, we were at a craft show, and it's raining terribly here. And she said, unbeknownst to us, lightning struck, and it struck our home. And we were 40 minutes away when we got the phone call. Our house is gone, Jan. It's gone. My dog was inside, and they're trying to find where he is right now. Dan, I have nothing left. The furniture is ruined. What wasn't ruined by the fire is ruined by smoke. I don't have pictures. My children were supposed to come home for Christmas, and I don't have a place for them to come to. That's a mess. That's a mess. I got off the phone, and I grabbed Kevin and we sat down and we prayed and, and when I'm done praying I'm looking around and I'm seeing all these little ornaments, all these precious things that are, it's just junk, it's just stuff, but they're memories and I'm realizing she doesn't have that. She'll no longer have this. She'll no longer have this. How do you get through that? You've been through that with one of your own and I'll tell you, I'll tell you how it's done. It's done not because you're strong, 
It's done not because you have resources. It's done not because you just pull yourself up and say it's just going to happen. It's not done by your power or your might. It is done by God's grace. By God's grace. It was grace that allowed Mary to ponder and to be perplexed and to live this journey and one day to say, oh God, please take this away from me. And the next day say, God, just help me through it because we are given the gift of hope and that hope is the very presence of God. It makes Christmas so very different because when we pretty it up, it feels like we need to come to Christmas all decked out all looking orderly and spiritual and all together. I mean, we want to say to Mary, you got this, Mary. I mean, you're full of grace. You got everything you need, so all's good. Well, all that does is separates us from the manger. It just separates us so that we're not convicted. Do you know that Jesus didn't come to make us feel good at Christmas? Jesus came to transform us at Christmas. And if you don't get transformed in this Advent season, then you're missing you're missing unwrapping the real gift at Christmas. So Mary was given grace. Kara tomina. Kara, grace. Not the same kind of grace that Stephen got when Stephen was stoned. We're told that he was full of grace. This is different grace. This is sanctifying grace that Mary receives. It's grace for the moment, for the moment, for the moment, for the moment. It's the same grace that we receive, that in the mess of our lives, in the very mess of our lives, we can say, we can do this not by ourselves and not within ourselves. We can do it because we are unwrapping the gift of grace. Mary's life, it was turned upside down with one pronouncement. That's what life does, doesn't it? just turns it upside down. We just don't even see it coming. It hits us so hard, and we wonder how are we ever going to put the pieces together again. Mary couldn't hear the angels singing in the fields. Mary couldn't know that the Magi had already left their home to come and bring gifts to a king. That's how long it took. She couldn't know all of that, that the shepherds were going to hear this pronouncement and they were going to come. She didn't know all of it, but she had the gift of grace that God was giving, sanctifying grace, grace on the move. And she had hope because hope is a decision that we make. It's a decision to believe that God can take the adversity, your disappointment, your heartache, and the pain of your journey, and God can use it to accomplish his purpose. That's what happened to Mary. And that's what God is asking us from this Christmas event, that it would happen to us as well. That is what we celebrate when we come up here to this altar, when we see the gifts of the bread and of the cup. This is God's grace. Through the sacrament of communion, what God says is, come, Come and, and you receive my grace in whatever mess that you find yourself, in whatever addiction that you seem like you cannot get over, whatever habit that you just keep thinking, tomorrow, Lord, tomorrow, I'll conquer it tomorrow. And God is saying, your life is a mess and you can't do that. You're not going to do anything of yourself. So just receive, just receive my grace because, oh, my grace it's sufficient for all the messes that you already have, that you've had, and that you will have in life. And so, friends, it's in this sacrament that we rejoice, that we can have joy and hope. Because as we look at this bread and as we drink from this cup, we understand that God has already provided all that we need. We understand that and we embrace it. And so we lift up the bread of heaven and we say, God, this, is, this was your choice. You chose to come, the divine, into the human. Uja, God's divinity now embodies human flesh. That God chose to come down to our level, into our mess. And then Jesus said, I choose, I choose to give up my life so that my people have hope and joy and peace and love 
and eternal life. And then Jesus lifted up the cup, the common cup, and he said, this is a symbol. As you drink from it, be thankful and know that this will help to remind you of the forgiveness that is poured out. There is no mess that God will not redeem. There is no mess that God's power and might cannot conquer. It may ha not happen today, but Jesus says, do not lose hope, for I am your hope. And I am your Redeemer. And so, friends, come today. Don't fix your hair. Don't make sure everything is neat and tidy when you come. You come being the mess that you are. And know that God sees you as someone precious in the midst of your mess and your darkness. What God is saying, you come to me. I know your life's a hot mess. But you come and you just extend your hands because I want to put grace in your heart, in your life, in your hands, in your feet, and in your heart for every moment that you live.